What's going on guys? Today I'm bringing you back another Q&A video. So if you have any questions, let's see them in the comment section and let's begin. Hey Alex, which OHP variation do you recommend has the best carryover for handstand push-ups? What about that one with a neutral grip? Yes. I think that's a great idea given the fact that Swiss bar pressing is much more difficult than the standard OHP. Neutral grip has the bar slightly more in front of you, therefore eliciting a much more challenging lockout. At the same time, if you use that closer position, you'll get a bit better carryover to the handstand push-up specifically. So what we have is an upper back stabilization exercise that allows us to get more out of less weight while simultaneously having high strength potential. Furthermore, I would advise performing the Z-press immediately after. Make those two exercises your bread and butter. Z-press, just like the neutral grip, allows for a difficult lockout position. You'll be straining like a madman and everything has to be tight and aligned. You'll find that when you get into the handstand position, you'll kind of bring back that sensation. You'll know how to control your body. And of course, if you're already doing lots of drills on top of it, everything is being reinforced. So this is what I recommend to you build your strength even further in a specific way. Hey Alex, I lifted bro splits for about two years from 16 to 18 and I've stopped for about a year. As you can imagine, it didn't do jack sh for gains. Is it too late for me to start the novice program? Thank you, no, it's never too late. You could have trained for five years straight. If you're still a novice lifter, you haven't hit the required strength standards and linear progression is able to take place on a weekly basis, you're a novice. We don't have to go by arbitrary standards of, oh, I've been training for this amount of time, you know? And the fact that you didn't make significant gains within that time frame says the whole story. Plus, you took a year off. So I'm going to say this too. Even if you were already intermediate, let's say you did make a lot of gains on that program, the fact that you took an entire year off will allow you to get those newbie gains once again. So isn't that great news? Milk it. Maybe you'll only be able to get away with it for three to six months because I'm sure you made some type of gains or maybe you didn't, I don't know. But regardless, don't stress. Run a novice program, everything's gonna be fine. You didn't lose out that opportunity. Alex, what would you suggest for teens suffering from gyno? I'm muscular and about 20% body fat, but even when I was lean around 13%, I still had it. What I'll first say is that most people don't know what their real body fat percentage is. They tend to overshoot or undershoot it by a good five points. So if you're 20% body fat, maybe you're 25, even 30. And the guys who claim 13 are typically around 18. Those who claim 10 are around 12 to 15. So this is just a trend that I've noticed time and time again. You're probably a lot fluffier than you realize. So I don't think you've gone as lean as you claim you hit. That's just a personal observation, especially given your age, which is not a judgment on my part. It's just an overall speculation here, okay? Especially if I apply it to other lifters who are reading this question as well. So make sure you're actually lean, for starters. Now, what I'll say beyond that is that puberty-induced gynecomastia tends to go away after a certain amount of time. In fact, I had a very close friend of mine who used to have these horrible-looking nipples, dude. People used to pinch them in the locker room. They actually made fun of him. And if he's watching right now, bro, I'm sorry but I didn't give you a name. Guess what? He lost his gyno, I think 20, 21 years old. He had it even as a late teenager. Eventually, it finally went away. So I hope that's gonna be the same case for you. And also, he built a lot of muscle. I'll tell you that the gyno didn't even matter because pecs were bulging out. We see this with a lot of steroid users as well. They do have a little bit of it, but the fact that their chest is so massive makes you not even notice. So I hope my answer is motivating, man. Get leaner, wait a little bit longer age-wise, and get jacked out of your damn mind. That should really help over time. Hey Alex, I'm a female and I'm not worried about chest size, only chest strength. Is it safe to feel my sternum inner chest area stretch a bit at the bottom of the dip? If it's a negative pain, I would absolutely be concerned and consider the fact that a lot of men have trouble with the sternum area. Probably has to do with structure. So I'm not surprised that you would also be feeling a little bit of pain, but know this is not a good thing. I believe you should start off with a lower stress variation of the dip, maybe even doing negatives for now or assisted with the bands just so that you develop that base level of strength, get that connective tissue right, and also include deficit push-ups to get used to that stretching sensation. In addition to band flies, make sure to get a nice squeeze and then stretch it explosively. So you should be doing very fast repetitions similar to what I described and demonstrated in my elbow pain solution segment. At the same time, please watch my video 
the way to dip solution. I give you a lot more guidelines in reducing pain. And maybe for you, that'll be a reduction in range of motion as well. And if after all that, you still get pain right here, it's not the muscle now, I know what you're talking about. You get that sternum pain, I would say you gotta drop the dips or maybe do it with the slingshot, you know, if you have access to one of those. So that should solve the entire problem. Some people just can't do dips. Or if they can't right now, they will at some point provide that they slowly ease into them using the strategies I just described. So I hope that was helpful. Oh, and I'll say one last thing. If you're getting stronger at dips, your pecs will grow. So you can't isolate the strength and size component, especially for this exercise, given the immense way to stretch. I actually prescribe this for guys who have lagging pecs. So you may wanna rethink your exercise selection if you're trying to minimize chest growth. Hey Alex, thank you for always putting up good content. Well, thank you too, I do my best. I have a question for you. With concurrent periodization, with a volume and intensity day, should I go heavy on accessories too? Or can I stay on a eight to 20 rep range, for example, on lateral raises or band crunches? Great question. I don't think it matters that much when talking about the traditional setup, volume day, intensity day. When doing accessory work, I don't feel like it interferes with the adaptations that much. You're doing a band face pull, a rear delt fly, a lateral raise, maybe even some hammer curls at the end. It doesn't matter that much. There's a big difference between the one rep max, 20 rep squats, and high repetitions on little movements done at the very end, just to further correct our weaknesses. I wouldn't stress about this whatsoever. This is pretty much what I do year round. Though, I try to divide it to a certain extent. Maybe one day I'll stay in the eight to 12 range, on the other day I'll be in the 15 to 20 range. So even though the reps might be on the higher side for the accessories, I still manipulate the volume a little bit. Not because it makes a massive difference hypertrophy wise, but because it probably minimizes overuse to a certain extent while blending slightly better from a performance standpoint. And you just feel less beat down overall. But the truth is you can mix it no problem. And actually the whole topic of interfering with the adaptations, I'm starting to question that more and more in the sense that maybe it's not as nuanced as we once thought. Perhaps there could be a lot more overlap and still be perfectly fine. And this is what I've been personally doing with my secondary and third press, primarily emphasizing reps of six to 10, which isn't triples and fives and doubles. And I feel like it hasn't hurt me in any type of way. If anything, it's better because I get greater recovery and I can focus more on the max effort training, which is the lowest possible velocity next to isometrics. So I'm getting my strain in. I am doing high intensity. Coupled with the high volume compounds, raises my strength potential because I'm building my size and maximum hypertrophy is needed for maximum strength. And the bench press, which is what I'm focusing on right now is not really a technical lift. So you got to think about that too. Does it really matter in the grand context of things? Maybe it does, but probably to a lesser extent than we once thought. So that's just some food for thought. I'm thinking of doing forms every day to gain some size. What do you think of doing 100 plus reps per day of Captain Crush grippers, wrist curls, wrist extensions? I would not recommend that with the Captain of Crush grippers and the wrist curls because I think it's gonna mess up your elbows. Too much overuse with that and could potentially harm your other workouts since the forms are engaged in every activity you do. The fact that you're doing crushing plus deflection, you're gonna be beat down. Whereas the extension is probably a fine idea. You can do the wrist extension plus the band finger extensions. This actually opens up. It reverses what we commonly do in our typical weight training sessions or even GPP. So from a restoration standpoint, I think it's much better to do what I just mentioned. Yeah, Alex, I've been progressively increasing the starting point with the 30 down squat workouts, but near the end, I get knee pain. I've started using knee wraps and it helps a lot, but will I be compromising long-term strength using these workouts? Thanks. I think what you're doing right now is a band-aid to a larger issue. You're starting to get some overuse, probably due to only using one style or you've been repeating this workout for a very long time without changing things up. Perhaps you should modify the way in which you squat, maybe even doing some pause at the bottom or widening out that stance, or even doing a box squat if you feel like it, right? So there's a variation to consider and also the fact that you're not really hitting your hamstrings adequately. And I think that is the major issue here you become a quad dominant lifter. So the simple solution is to get yourself some bands, attach them to something stationary like a kitchen table or a power rack like you see here and start doing band leg curls on a consistent basis. 
If you can work on that area with the overspeed eccentrics, getting a nice squeeze in, I think that will reduce your knee pain more than anything else. Even if we don't even talk about adjusting that template itself. So there's a muscular imbalance that needs addressing. And the knee wraps, we can make arguments that perhaps they're not the best for your knees to begin with. Knee sleeves are okay, but wraps, different effect here. And I've never used them myself, but I've seen some good arguments speaking against them. And also for, but I tend to lean more in the other direction that maybe long-term, you shouldn't really be dealing with this all the time, at least during your regular training. You know, for competition and everything, I can understand that, but should you use knee wraps every workout? No, no, no. So I want you to ask why you're getting knee pain and address the root cause. That's what's gonna make the biggest difference in the long term, my friend. Recently, I've discovered that my deficit deadlift is stronger than my conventional, not only percentage-wise, but overall stronger. I seem to get more leg drive in the deficit position. Should I focus more on block pulls in order to correct this? Or what's the problem solution to this? Yes, you've identified what your weak points are. Obviously, your quads are a bit stronger proportionally. So the deficit deadlift, because you get slightly more leg drive, it doesn't matter that the range of motion has been increased. You're able to use one of your strong areas. Most guys are not like this. Their deficit deadlift tends to be around 20 pounds less, sometimes more, sometimes similar, but in your case, you find it to be even better. Now that's a cool thing and you can continue to improve on your deficit pulls. It's not gonna harm you necessarily, just that my approach these days is to focus on exercises in which you are terrible at. There's no compromise of strength gains and you're gonna get carry over regardless while actually correcting what is lagging behind. In your case, you pretty much called it out right off the bat. Block pulls, man. Slight elevation, no more than around one to three inches, and that should improve your standard pull automatically. And what I can also say is that there was a lifter at the West Side Gym who had this exact problem. I believe he pulled 900 off the ground and around 860 or so off blocks, which you would think is the opposite, but some guys are genuinely built that way. So it sounds to me as if you have the exact same issue, just train the opposite of how most guys do it. Most guys have trouble in that bottom position, so they do deficit pulls. For you, do more block pulls, and even the standard pull from the ground. Thoughts on high volume intensity warmups like the winning warmup for natural beginner lifters? It's a great strategy overall, but I don't know if I would recommend it for a novice lifter because you simply don't need it. It's not like you're experiencing overuse injuries right now, and chances are you are running a basic novice program that is rather minimalist in nature little exercise rotation, um, the classics. So if you're not getting snapped up from that, despite having high volume and going to the gym very frequently, does the concern for winning warmups really apply to you? I would say possibly, but to a much lesser degree than a guy like me. So for that reason alone, the fact that you could get away with this current setup and not feel snapped up to any significant extent makes this strategy less important in my books but if you feel like doing it now just for that extra precaution then there's nothing wrong with that hey alex i love lifting weights and i've been putting on some size over the last three years i also play soccer football professional in leagues but lately my size and strength has plateaued do you think it's because of rigorous cardio training and how can i get past this no i wouldn't say it's due to the cardio not directly anyway it's more so the fact that you've been training seriously for three years you've put on a significant amount of muscle mass in that time frame and usually after the five-year mark, that's when most of the gains occur physically that you don't see like crazy changes year after year after that point. So that three to five-year time frame is excellent and it sounds like you're in there. So you're already jacked, you already look amazing. And maybe plateaus are a natural progression in the sense that you need to get far more intelligent with your programming. You need to maybe start doing something like concurrent periodization. I know that in my case, I had plateaus left and right with minimalism. It wasn't until I addressed the program that progression started to take place again. And to this day, I'm still promoting the system because it really does work. So that's what I would recommend to you as well. And also the cardio thing, maybe you're doing so much that you're actually in a calorie deficit or you're constantly close to maintenance but not really at it. During 2019, I was doing so much cardio that I lost weight. I was back down to 163. I wasn't my best, obviously. And then I regained a little bit of weight and boom, muscle memory came back. So that was entirely my fault in the sense that I lost weight because of doing excessive cardio and I wasn't re-eating the calories. That's how brutal it was. So for you as a professional, I would say that's the most likely situation. You're just burning off what you're consuming and you need to pay more attention to diet. So if you fix that, you can do all the cardio in the world, my friend. 
That said, I wanna add one extra thing to your question. Are you sure it's a good idea to get to that level of muscular development as a professional soccer player? From what I've seen, they don't tend to be the most muscular, at least compared to natural bodybuilders or even powerlifters. So I don't know if that would be a hindrance to your performance. I suppose we could base it off your vertical jump or your speed work. I'm sure there's things we can test in the gym to ensure that you're not compromising your performance necessarily. But I think that there is an ideal weight for your height and your sport. Maybe you shouldn't reach your full muscular potential if you wish to excel at soccer to your highest capabilities. Can I use kettlebell swings for GPP? You bet, bro. That's one of the main reasons why I bought mine, which is only 40 pounds, but guess what? It gets the job done. I find it to be very helpful for the posterior chain and making sure that your lower back feels rejuvenated. So I'll always do some swings at the end of my routine or on off days for GPP. And one thing you can experiment with is combining kettlebells with burpees. And I'll share with you something that I learned from Iron Wolf. Do one burpee, 25 kettlebell swings. Two burpees, 24 kettlebell swings. Three burpees, 23 kettlebell swings. And you keep going till it's inverted. Then you can stop right then and there or go back the opposite way. That would be a brutal freaking session. That's conditioning 101, my friend. So give that a shot. That's just one little thing you could do. But of course, there's other kettlebell routines I can share. So I will be posting more content on conditioning type workouts, but for now, definitely give that a shot. Is it normal to be way stronger at curls than tricep extensions, even though I work my triceps a lot more than biceps? Initially, that is completely normal, but at some point, if you do acquire an elite bench press, your extensions will be stronger by default, but not for every variation. What I'll say is, the dumbbell curl will likely be stronger than your dumbbell extension. Just the nature of those two exercises are not comparable in that way. But the barbell curl will likely be weaker than your barbell extension, at least in terms of what you can do, not necessarily how you're gonna train. So at some point, things do balance out, kind of similar to weighted dips and weighted pull-ups. Maybe your pull up stronger right now, but I can guarantee at some point you might hit five, six plates in the weighted dip, which maybe you'll never hit in your entire life on a pull-up. Probably you'll tap out around three and a half, four plates, just saying. So generally speaking, your pushing exercises will outperform your pulling once you're at a certain level. And of course, I'm excluding deadlifts here. And I'm not talking about cheat rows versus bench press either if we're talking about that subject. But yeah, it, it is normal right now. And maybe you're doing 40-pound dumbbell curls, 25-pound tricep extensions. That's normal. I wouldn't call it an imbalance, okay? How to fix imbalanced pecs, one bigger than the other one. First, analyze the shape. Is it really a muscular imbalance size-wise, or do they just look differently? What I can say in my physique is that each pec looks different and has nothing to do with my performance or imbalances of any type. It's just the shape. The left one attaches slightly more inwards, whereas the other one curves. Can't do anything about that, it's genetic. There's no amount of training, no secret system that will ever modify that. So maybe in your case, you have that same illusion going on. As long as you're not getting snapped up, and when you look at your exercise, your form is tight, is this really a problem? That said, if it's a legitimate muscular weakness, I wouldn't say that unilateral work is a solution, even though I did hear a pretty good protocol for that once. High frequency pressing exclusively on that side until things catch up. So if you can do 90 pound dumbbell pressing on your left arm for 10 and can only perform six on your right, only train the right arm for as long as it takes until you match it with those 10 reps or even surpassing it to a certain extent. So now when you go do those two arms, you're balanced like you're supposed to be. So that's one protocol that's pretty smart, but I'm not gonna recommend it. I think it has to do with improper form on bilateral exercises. Your bench press, grip width is off. You're not tight enough. The form hasn't been totally refined yet. So for that, I'm gonna recommend you look into more tutorials, strip that weight down, and start building back up, and maybe even introducing other variations to the bench so that you learn how to find your groove. And I've talked a lot about that in my training videos, so you can check those out. To me, pectoral muscular imbalances are attributed to using improper form for long periods of time and getting progressively stronger with that form. So the way to correct it is by addressing what got you there in the first place. Alex, what are your thoughts on Zercher good mornings instead of conventional good mornings for posterior chain development? 
We're in lockdown in the UK. I'm at home using limited amounts of weight and I don't have a rack to load the bar, but well, it sounds like you got your answer. You want to incorporate good mornings because you recognize the posterior chain benefits and the fact that even with limited weights, you'll be able to pull 500 plus. Check out my video, how to get jacked with 135. That's more than enough weight for this exercise, especially if you high rep it. So Zercher good mornings. I do them myself and they absolutely work. Just that you got to get your tight setup in. And I found that when you go past a certain number, they tend to be a lot more uncomfortable. That said, I would be curious in trying it with a harness, but I've never really messed with those. So this should not be a problem for you because as you indicated, weights are limited. But one thing I can also recommend is pressing it over your head and doing it as normal. If you're not going heavy, you can do this. Heck, even if it was as high as 185, you can always push press it, lower it down. Obviously it won't be as comfortable and it's slightly more challenging to get in that starting position. But once you have it on your back, you can adjust and be all good. So I can see you doing both variations, not just as a style, since you're not going heavy. Hey, Alex, is one arm dumbbell press a viable variation to do for max effort on the OHP specialization program? Cheers and keep being awesome. Thank you, brother. It is a viable option, but the carryover can vary from person to person. Having done that myself in the past, I can say that it didn't work the best for me. I found that one arm dumbbell pressing is much more effective as a secondary exercise. Treating it for reps of three to five or even staying in the six to 10 zone. I don't like maxing out on it, even though it does test your strength for the simple reason that there tends to be a lot more back bending. And from what I've found, maxing out on unilateral lifts doesn't give you the same degree of carryover as maxing out on a bilateral lift. Might sound strange, but that's what I found to be true in my case, man. Not that it doesn't work when you do it with the dumbbells because strength is strength and it's still another max effort variation that could be incorporated. So I'm not telling you to not do it, but in terms of specificity, I found that just bar work in general makes more sense. But again, that's my weird little build. I was not blessed on the OHP. I have hypermobile elbows and I don't respond the same way to certain movements compared to other guys. We're all built different. At the end of the day, you gotta address your weaknesses. And I suppose the only way you'll find out if carryover takes place is if you start maxing out on the dumbbell pressing frequently. Then you'll know what's up. But definitely, as an addition to your workout for volume work, nothing wrong with this. Oh, would you look at that? That was actually the last question of the week, guys. So I guess we're done. If you have any more, let's see them in the comment section and I'll talk to you in the next one.